Hi everyone, welcome back to my top 500 games and we are currently at number 170 and that is Castle Crashes. This is a game that was originally an Xbox 360 live arcade game and I was shown this game also by my friend Alex who I knew from university. I believed he showed me this during the second year of university and I played it with him. Basically it's a beat em up apart from it has a leveling system so hooray for that. You have the four characters which are the four castle crashes, one for each colour, there's red, blue, green and yellow and as you level them up you have to choose a stat to upgrade grid and you can also collect these different animals that you can carry around with you and the animal companions are basically like a boost it's it's like a piece of equipment basically so you might have one that boosts your attack power or one that boosts your resistance against a certain thing or the one that i liked the one that increased your experience and so this is one of those games where you do repeat levels in order to be able to gain more stats and level up and stuff. Which I know I've said that modern games tend to not do that so much. And if we're going to lump this game in the modern category, which I would in this particular context, then I would say that that's quite interesting that it does that. Really though, I don't have too much to say about this game. I remember having problems trying to get it to work online on my Xbox 360 because I remember I was trying to play with my friend Andy, who's also from university, and we had problems playing two-player. There was something wrong with it where it glitched if you tried to play two-player, apparently. This is what he said, but I don't know. It was rather strange. Number 169 is Books and Taz Time Busters. Now this is a sort of sequel slash spiritual successor to Books Bunny Lost in Time. Now, if you don't remember, Books Bunny Lost in Time is a PS1 3D platform game where you play as Books Bunny and you have to collect all of the time symbols, the clocks, and you travel between different time periods. And this is basically the same idea, apart from instead of collecting these time symbols, the clocks, you have to collect these gears and each gear has a number on it representing how much they are worth so you do actually have ones with different values on. This game actually has a lot fewer worlds than Lost in Time does and in fact I never actually complete this game. You start off in the Aztec world and you eventually go to the Viking world and then you have the Greek world and I think you then have a sort of Transylvania horror world which I got stuck on I couldn't get past that but I did really enjoy this game and in fact my brother ranks this game a lot higher than I do he thought it was a brilliant brilliant platform game I wouldn't say it was that good but I do think it is good enough. What I liked about this game was that I felt that the levels and the worlds felt big enough. I don't mean in a sort of, you know, like a modern day, it's a big open world type of thing, but I just kind of felt like the areas had a particular, a nice size to them. But the main gimmick of this game is that you play as not just Bugs Bunny, but also Tasmania. I was going to say Ty the Tasmanian Tiger then, but then I realised that's something completely different. No, it's Tasmania. Taz. Hold on, Taz the Tasmanian Devil. That's it, Tasmania. His name is Tasmania, is it? Or is he called Taz? I forget. It's His name is Taz, but I think the TV show is called Tasmania, and he's a Tasmanian Devil, but I don't know. Whatever. He's Taz. But yeah, you have two characters that you play as in this game, Books and Taz, and one way that you can play this game is two-player. So you have one player who is Bugs Bunny and the other player who is Taz. But you can play the single player by switching between the characters. And you have a character with the magic mirror that allows you to control them or they have the camera. If you are playing in the context of two players, the character with the mirror is the one that has the camera, the one that controls the camera. And if you're playing one player, then the context is that the one with the mirror is the one that you're controlling. You can also press a button to hand the mirror over to the other character or the the player if you're playing two players and there's also a button that you can press to bring the other character to where you are so say if you're playing as bugs you can press the button to bring taz over to you though i think in two players it's the other way around where you press the button and you go towards the other character or something like that 
But what this game also features is a sort of dual life system, which I've noticed has become prevalent in other games, in other platform games, other multiplayer platform games, where if one character dies, they won't necessarily die. They'll just float around in a bubble or whatever until the other players can like pop those bubbles and then you officially lose a life or you officially die or whatever if you all enter this bubble state. And this is kind of the same thing here because it's not necessarily a bubble, but say if Taz gets killed, he'll be locked inside this crate and then Bugs has to break open the crate so that Taz can come out. It's the same idea. What differentiates Bugs and Taz is their abilities. So for example Taz is the strong one basically so Taz can push the blocks and Bugs is the nimble one. So Bugs can fit through small gaps and Bugs can also fall into the little rabbit holes as he does in Lost in Time and if there's an area where there could be a rabbit hole but isn't Taz can dig to make a rabbit hole so there's an element of teamwork there. You also have different mini games scattered around the different worlds as well where you'll come across someone who's like here's a memory game remember these button combinations and it'll be like right triangle x or whatever and it'll do like a musical thing where like they're playing tambourines or something or i think there's one in the viking world where you have to play ice hockey with a bunch of enemies Number 168 is Mega Man 9. Now, I know I have put other Mega Man games in the same series a lot further back. And I know that Mega Man, in general, doesn't change that much. But the reason I am putting Mega Man 9 so much higher, and I think the reason why I naturally enjoy Mega Man 9 so much, is because I wasn't introduced to it in such a way that it was put on such a high pedestal. Although, saying this, I understand that this is a very, very flawed reason to claim that a game is really good. Like, oh, my expectations were so high, right? I generally think that's a not a very good reason to judge a game. But I remember when it came out, and it came out on the PS3 and Wii and Xbox 360 and, and I just enjoyed the game. I mean, what can I say? Like, I can understand from a technical perspective that it's not really that much different from, you know, Mega Man 1 and 2, but I just have to base this on my experiences, to be honest. But, yeah, I never did beat this game because it's too hard. I mean, to me, Mega Man is just in general really hard. I don't understand when people say it's not that hard because I think it really is. Because some of the platforming jumps you have to make are so specific and you have to react so quickly to certain things. I don't know. People say that about Sonic, but I think that's ridiculous. But Mega Man, yeah, it's really hard. I think I was only able to beat a couple of the robot masters on this game. I remember I did beat Galaxy Man and... I may have beaten Jewel Man. In, fa in fact, I think I did beat Jewel Man, but the level's really hard. I remember with Concrete Man, I actually managed to get to the boss, but the boss was too hard for me to be able to beat. And did I beat Splash Woman? Maybe. I remember when Mega Man 9 was announced, and the whole Splash Woman thing about having a female robot master was such a big deal. But also, compared to, say, Mega Man 2, I do think this game has really good music. I honestly don't think... I think Mega Man 2 has good music, but I think it's really put on too high of a pedestal for my liking. I think this game does have better music. I think, at least from what I can remember, it has better level design. I just find it a better game overall. And there was a time in 2000 and 10 where I was at university and I used to get on with my coursework. I remember I used to listen to an episode of Noob 2 whilst doing my work and I would also, after finishing an episode of Noob 2, I would switch to this playlist of midis that I had collected on my account and I just had like all these tracks and I'd have them on shuffle of these game midis and I had quite a few Mega Man 9 tracks on there as well. I remember Hornet Man was one I listened to quite a lot. Also, a funny story about the music for this game is that there was one time where I had a tune in my head and I had no idea what it was. And I was like singing it in my head. And I said to my brother, I said, do you know what this tune is? And then I sang it to him. And he was like, I don't know. And he's a, well, I'll say a bigger fan than I am when it comes to Mega Man. But yeah, he didn't know what it was. And then I was like thinking, is it a Mega Man theme? I think it's a Mega Man theme. So I was looking at the different Mega Man themes. And then I found out it was Magna Man. Magma Man. I am mixing up words there, aren't I? Magma Man, not Magna Man. Magna, it's Magma Man. Right, okay. Before I get any more tongue-tied, I'm going to move on to the next game.
number 167 is bloodlines now stop if you're thinking about castlevania bloodlines no there's always been times where i've tried to google this game and tried to find information and stuff and pretty much all the time i've done that it's come up with castlevania bloodlines that's not the game i'm talking about it's a game just called bloodlines and this is one of those games where it's really hard to find information of I think that the reason for this, and I think I eventually found out that this game was only released in Europe, which is a very, very strange thing for a game, but I discovered this game originally because I had a demo of it, and this is how I discovered a few games for the PS1, and as always, my granddad copied it for me, and this is one of those games that I requested because I played it on a demo, and in the demo, you can have the choice of three characters, Kafka, Alex, and Maya, I think she's called, and the way that Bloodlines works is that it's kind of like a multiplayer party game type thing, and what happens is you've got this arena, and and around this arena are all these green lights and each player has a certain colour associated to them. So player one is red or this orangey colour and player two is blue. And it's kind of like a game of, you know, tag or tig or whatever you want to call it depending on what country you're from. But the first person to reach one of these lights turns the light to their colour and then they get the glow and then they have to turn so many lights to their colour in order to win the round. And if the other player catches them, they'll like hit them and then they'll get the control. They'll have the light so they'll go around and they can turn the lights to their own colour. Also you can collect these little power-ups such as there's one which is like a bomb that will blow up or a missile that will shoot out and hit the enemy. But you also have these little things that you shoot out just generally, like by pressing the swear button. So you'll always see these little little dots fly out of all the characters and shoot them into the other characters, just to slow the other players down a bit. And each character also has three charge bars, and they can be used for different things. For one, you can charge up a big powerful shot with it. Secondly, you can use your unique power because each character has their own unique power that they can do. And also you can use them to neutralize the light, which generally isn't a very good thing anyway. To neutralize a light, what that means is that if you neutralize a light that is your color, you will lock it down for a bit. So it gets protected. Also, if you use it to a green one, which is what you have when one of these lights hasn't been claimed yet, it also locks it down so that it can't be taken. But if you neutralize one that's another player's color, then it becomes green again. Generally neutralizing isn't really worth it all that much. And also you go through arcade mode through as whatever character you select and you always go against each character in a set order and so there's about four or so characters that you can unlock and you have a bunch of characters to start with such as Alex whose ability is to dash forward and then you have Maya whose ability is to bounce I don't know what the benefit of that is, but she can bounce. Kafka, who is perhaps the most simplest slash newbie character slash one that I like using, is the one that can use push-pull. And push-pull is you either attract or repel your opponent depending on whether or not you are chasing them or they are chasing you. And then you've got other characters that can shoot missiles out or do a high jump or whatever there isn't really that much variance there's a character called john who his power is to do whatever the ca character that he's up against does which isn't very creative but it means you have someone to fight against when you would technically be fighting yourself and this character john spelled j-o-n whenever you select him his little taunt thing he goes forgive me for what i'm about to do and that was like an in joke between me and my brother again like a meme like you know the whole my name is merlin and i am a sorcerer thing just all these little jokes and that was one of them and then you get other characters that you unlock later on such as angor who can climb walls dara who has the probably the most irritating ability of making you switch places and then joe who is like this robot who can shoot out this massive flame thing and you can also choose different types of levels as well so you've got like the bronze tier the silver tier and the gold tier and the higher up you go the more complex the arenas get it's quite interesting number 166 is robot wars arena of destruction now this game is what i originally judged or 
but rather this game is what I set my expectations for with the Game Boy Advance game, Advance Destruction, which was a terrible mistake because obviously it's going to be nowhere near. But this was one of the very, very first PS2 games I ever played because before I had a PS2, my dad's wife's son, Ian, had a PS2 and I once went to my dad's house and there was some of that extended family round and there was a kid called Johnny there and there were three PS3 sorry three PS2 games there Robot Wars there was a wrestling game that I didn't care about and then there was a FIFA game a football game that I didn't care about I only cared about Robot Wars and so I was really excited to play Robot Wars and I did and I loved the whole thing about building a robot and competing in this Robot Wars type environment and then having to like repair your different parts of the robot and just you know as if you were actually taking part in Robot Wars and I loved Robot Wars when I was a kid and this game unlike the Game Boy Advance version this was more about the actual creating a robot rather than the robots that were in the series although I do believe you could unlock them at some point I didn't but I think you could and what else made this stand out from that one is that this one was actually competent it actually felt like you were playing robot wars and I loved that but before I got a PS2 I was really interested in robot wars and so I got the PC version of the game which didn't work on our PC, and my granddad was saying, it's not like your game console where you can just put it in and play. Yeah, he's a Geordie if you're wondering why I put on that weird accent there. And so I had the PC version and couldn't play it, but I eventually got it on PS2 when I got my PS2. And I remember there was sometimes I'd play it with my brother and we'd sit in my room and sometimes we'd sit on the floor because of the way that my room was arranged and we'd eat Doritos and French bread and pate, which we haven't had for a long time. We'd play Robot Wars. Oh, the joys of those memories. Number 165 is Magna Carta 2. Now, I'm not going to have so much to say about this game because I feel like I didn't really play this game too much to be able to go into really a lot of depth about the mechanics, but my friend Bridge had the original Magna Carta on the PS1 around mid-early 2000s or so, maybe 2004 around that time. And I got Magna Carta 2 eventually on the PS, no, sorry, on the Xbox 360, and I actually got really into it because it was around, I think, maybe 2011 or 2010, around that time. I got my Xbox 360 in 2010, and I had hit a point, I think it's like I sort of like hit a wall, I think the saying goes, where I just couldn't really be bothered with games. I thought that I absolutely couldn't be bothered with games, but I didn't feel like I really, really got into games as much as I used to in the past. And this game was a breath of fresh air because I started up and I felt like I was really getting into it. And I like the whole concept of, you know, a, an action RPG where you do have to press individual buttons for individual attacks. I mean, I prefer turn-based, but I like this one where you had this sort of charge bar, so you still had to be somewhat methodical in your actions. You could just keep attack, attack, attack. You had to make sure that you didn't overdo it so that your characters overheated. And I like that. Also, something to point out is that in this game, characters talk to each other as if they're an instruction manual. I mean, this isn't something that really bothers me much, but it's something I've noticed with some games where the characters will say things that pertain to it being a game. Like, you'll have someone who's like, when you press the left trigger, you'll enter combat mode. Combat mode? What's that? It means that you can attack enemies with the A button. Huh. So... If I attack enemies with the A button, what does the B button do? The B button raises your shield. Oh, you know, things like that. That's how the characters talk in this game sometimes. Not that it bothers me, I know it bothers some people, but it can be a bit jarring sometimes, I suppose. But I am going to end this part here, so thank you everyone listening and everyone who's watching. I will see you next time.